think that's the antidote to the technological world is fostering that real sense of community amongst our children and also ourselves and finding those relationships or creating them, making them a priority so that we have that built-in support network and structure and something that makes us want to go outside or spend time with others and not just be inside watching TV. Hello and welcome to the Ultimate Health Podcast, episode 283. Jesse Chapp is here with Marnie Wasserman, and we are here to take your health to the next level. Each week, we'll bring you inspiring and informative conversations about health and wellness, covering topics of nutrition, lifestyle, fitness, mindset, and so much more. And this week, our featured guest is Katie Wells, also known as Wellness Mama. She's a wife and mom of six, as well as an award-winning blogger, author, podcaster, and real food crusader. Her mission with wellnessmama.com is to provide simple answers for healthier families through practical tips, real food recipes, natural beauty and cleaning tutorials, natural remedies, and more. It's so great to have Katie on the show. She has impacted so many mamas around the world on how to live a more conscious and healthy life while raising kids. If anyone knows how to be a mama, it's Katie. As Jesse said, she has six kids and she has so much information to share with us today. So here's what we get into. The story behind Wellness Mama why it took eight doctors before Katie was diagnosed with Hashimoto's, navigating pregnancy with Hashimoto's, what to feed your baby first, how to create systems at home that work, Katie's approach to family mealtime, how to reduce plastic use in your home, removing exposure to chemicals in your home, and how to save money and make your own household cleaning products. Katie is just amazing. She's got so much knowledge to share with us. I'm so excited for you guys to hear this. Here we go with Katie Wells. Hi, Katie. How are you? Welcome to the podcast. I'm wonderful. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited. It's great to have you on the show, Katie. And you have so much wonderful health and wellness information for the mothers out there, for the health enthusiasts in general. But before we get into that, this is the first time on the show. So I want to get into your story a bit and start off by talking about a story that I came across preparing for the interview of you meeting your husband walking across the country one summer in college. So take us back there and tell us how that all came to be. Yeah, absolutely. It's actually a little bit tied into my health story as well. So I was one of those that did everything early, finished high school early, graduated with some of college already done. At 18 and a half, I was finishing up college and having that kind of existential crisis that all 18-year-olds think they're having and not knowing what I wanted to do with my life. Uh, Until that point, I was pretty sure I was going to do some kind of legal career or political science or international studies. And that's what my majors had kind of set me up for. And after all of that, I realized I wasn't really interested in those things and didn't really want to. So in a completely mature way, I ran away that summer, essentially, and found a nonprofit that walked from Los Angeles to D.C. And it took about two and a half months to make the entire walk. And we, as a group, physically walked every single mile. And so I thought that would be a good way to clear my head and figure out what I was going to do with my life, which seemed such a daunting thing to figure out at that point. When I first arrived on the walk, I remember thinking, oh, thank goodness, nobody here is my type. I can just focus on figuring stuff out and walking and clearing my head. And little did I know that a relationship would develop. So it turns out when you walk 20 miles a day with someone, you get to know them really quickly. And so one of the guys on the walk who later became my husband, we got really close during that walk and actually ended up spending a couple of weeks together in Europe after the walk. Yeah, it was one of those unexpected life has other plans for you type moments. And uh, yeah, met him that way. And we've been together ever since. Wow, what an incredible story. And you talk about how during the walk, you actually didn't sleep much. And you guys often said, we'll sleep when we're dead. And I know your whole philosophy on that's changed a lot since then. But explain how that happened. Were you guys walking through the night as well? Or how did that work? Yeah, so basically, it was pretty mathematical. There were 10 college students on the walk. And the goal was to cover every mile between Los Angeles and DC by foot ourselves. We split into two groups. We had a day shift and a night shift. There's five of us on each group. We would usually split off in groups of two and take shifts of walking anywhere between a mile to three miles, and then we could rest while the other group was walking. So at night, that meant you got maybe an hour of sleep, an hour of walking, hour of sleep, hour of walking, and then you could try to sleep during the day. But in an RV in the sun, it wasn't very good sleep, and you definitely weren't getting much melatonin because there was no darkness. So we kind of alternated day shift and night shift, but that whole summer, I think our circadian rhythms were completely off because we didn't know when we would be sleeping next or walking next, and we were eating at three in the morning if that was the only time we had to eat in a day. That's probably one of the worst things you could do for your circadian rhythm and your cortisol would be to walk all night long and eat peanut butter and jelly sandwiches at 3 a.m. But uh, that's what we had to do to get through the walk and to make it by the end of the summer. So that's what we did. 
And you said at this time, this is the start of a lot of your health story as well. So where did some of your health challenges begin as well? Yeah. So even in the last few years, I've learned so much more just about the mind, body, and emotional connection. And I think that's a large component of it too. But what I realized was I had always been very type A my whole life and go, 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 go. So the whole I'll sleep when I die was not new just to the walk. I was that way very much in high school and college as well. I think at one point had 21 hours one semester and 18 hours another semester and tons of extracurriculars. And in high school, I was in 40 activities. So I pretty much wasn't sleeping from the time I was about 13 on. And I would just push through the stress. It was very, very driven, which I think led to a lot of the problems as well, just the not sleeping, high stress, not eating or eating horrible food when I would eat. And so the walk probably was an extreme stress on my adrenals, my liver and everything else. And then after that walk, deciding that I did not want a political career, which I'm super grateful for that decision and what came out of it, but we actually decided to get married instead. So I had a journalism degree and I was figuring I would pursue that instead and go into journalism. We got married and I got pregnant with my first son. And I think the combination of all of the physical stresses of the walk and the lack of sleep combined then with a year later pregnancy was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back. And so all of these like minor symptoms that I had seen twinges of throughout high school and college, um, whether it be skin things or just slight cognitive stuff or digestive issues, they kind of all catapulted into full-blown autoimmune disease at that point. And it would be years before I figured out eventually that it was Hashimoto's, but I knew at that point something was wrong. And that kind of started my quest to figure out what it was. And with my journalism background, research had always been my antidote to any problem. And so when I started experiencing problems, I immediately turned to research and used a lot of my journalism connections to get access to medical journals and doctors and just start asking questions. And it's shocking to look back now and think this, but it was truly the first time in my life that I really made the connection that what we eat really impacts our health on a deep level beyond just calories, because that's the narrative that you're taught in school. And so really realizing like food quality and the biochemical process that happens when you eat anything or come in contact with anything was really a big rabbit hole for me to just start researching. And from there, even catapulting into realizing how contact through the air and through the skin of things that we put on our body and in our environment can have just as dramatic of an impact. And as we had more kids, that became increasingly important for me to realize that it wasn't just me who was going to be impacted by these things. They were actually more vulnerable. And so I just kept diving deeper into the research of how I could create a calm and safe home environment without all of these negative inputs in the environment, in the food, in the air, et cetera. And I'd love for you to tell the story how the name Wellness Mama came to be. I know this has to do with when you had your first son, you're in the doctor's office having a follow-up visit and you came across a magazine. So I'll just let you take it from there. Yeah, absolutely. If any parents listening know those first few weeks with a newborn, especially your first newborn, can be pretty intense and exhausting. And so I was still very much in that and trying to figure out nursing and what to do with this baby. And it was that six week follow up appointment. And the doctor was running late because his babies tend to come on their own schedule. I think he was at a delivery at first. So I was sitting there waiting forever with this baby who was frustrated. And I was just reading through pretty much everything in the waiting room while I was waiting for my appointment. And nursing my baby, the, one of the last articles I came to was in, I think it was Time Magazine. And the quote that stood out to me was that for the first time in two centuries, the current generation of American children would have a shorter life expectancy than their parents. And that was my lightning bolt moment in a sense, because I was already starting to try to research these things from my own health perspective. But any parent knows that a parent will do anything for their child. And that really cemented it. This problem was so far beyond just my health problem. We were facing a massive society-wide epidemic. The article went through to detail the rates of cancer and autoimmune disease and heart disease and diabetes and just everything that our kids' generation would face. It lit a fire in me that that was not okay and that I was going to do whatever I could to stop that statistic and not just to spare my own kids, but to spare all kids from that future. And somewhat young and naive, I didn't know what that would look like or if it would even be possible, but definitely ignited a passion in me that day to start changing that. So being home and kind of alone with a baby all the time, I turned to writing, which was my outlet, and started writing about the health side as I started researching it. And I think there very much was an aspect of being in the right place at the right time. There were a lot of people that seemed to be going through a similar story at a similar time. And I think the community started growing in that way. The irony about the name, I don't say this often, but the original name I wanted was actually wellnessmom.com because it seemed to have a ring to it, but it was a premium domain and it was like thousands of dollars that we definitely didn't have. I settled on Wellness Mama instead. And since then, I think it was The Atlantic wrote a whole article about how our generation is bringing back Mama and the rise of Mama. And 
they cited us as an example of that. And I just laughed because it was totally inadvertent. I just couldn't afford wellnessmom.com, which we ironically do now own. Nice. So just to kind of put this full picture here, I know having a baby, you mentioned that was potentially part of what threw your health off. Uh, You had a number of factors that were all culminating together at that time. So what were your symptoms like at that point when you came across that article in the doctor's office? Yeah, so there was definitely a combination of some that would be relatively normal postpartum of just difficulty losing weight, feeling very tired and sluggish when you're not sleeping with a baby, feeling cold all the time was one that kind of was like, "Mm, that's odd. Losing my hair, which is also very normal again after having a baby. But I was tracking my basal body temperature as well and realized that my body temperature was lower than it had been. And I was watching that trend. So over the next few years and through the next couple of kids, I noticed this get worse and worse. And I kept asking doctors to test me. And as I was researching, I would ask for thyroid tests. And then I eventually learned I needed to ask for the full panel thyroid test. And it was really difficult to get doctors to look at that because they would all want to test just one or two markers. And if those were normal, they didn't want to test the other. And I got told so many times that it was all in my head and it was just completely normal postpartum and nothing was wrong. And I just needed to get some rest. And it wasn't until it took literally eight doctors before I finally found a doctor who had a specialty in Hashimoto's. And before even lab tests, within 10 minutes, he felt my thyroid, felt nodules and was like, hands down, you absolutely have Hashimoto's which was actually a very freeing day for me in a sense because I finally had answers and I could start moving forward to try to reverse that and to feel better. It was years and years when I went through that phase of not being able to get answers and not feeling heard by doctors, which thankfully now there's so many amazing doctors doing so much amazing work and you can access them online or digitally. But that was not the case when I was in that phase. And I just remember feeling so stuck and so helpless, which also really fueled the blogging side, because I realized there were many, many other women who were feeling the exact same way. And I was researching not just to find my own answers, but answers for them as well. And just kind of this very strong sense of injustice that we didn't have access to answers when we were suffering in that way. As someone who also has Hashimoto's, I can totally feel you. I went through, I'd say a couple of years of not being given clear answers. And I had to really fight for my own blood work to get the results that I needed to move forward. So I'm curious, Katie, what were some of the first steps that you took when you found out you had Hashimoto's, you got an answer, now what? What did you do with this information? It definitely led to a whole nother world of research for me about what autoimmune disease was and wasn't. The irony was I had already researched my way into a really clean diet and lifestyle by this point. So I was already doing a lot of the things that they would tell you to do if you had Hashimoto's. I wasn't eating inflammatory foods. I was avoiding inflammatory compounds in my environment. I was as much as possible for a mom trying to sleep and reduce stress. But I realized that there were other like internal things that I needed to focus on. So it was just a very long research process. And what it's really illustrated to me at this point after now 12 years of this path is that there's a tremendous degree of personalization. And even amongst the experts who are the best in the world, they truly can't figure out exactly what's going to work for you, that we all have to be very much active in our own healthcare decisions. Because there are many times just out of exhaustion, I would try to just follow the exact advice of a specialist or a practitioner thinking it would be easier. And something in the program or the protocol wouldn't work exactly for my symptoms or what I was trying in my own body to fix. And so that was what really illustrated to me and that I write a lot about now is just the personalization and variation in us each having to figure out as we go what's working for us individually. And I think that seems to be very much a trend right now in health. And I'm so excited to see it is that the increased focus on personalization. Several years ago, I had a moment where I just kind of looked at all of the experts and all of the approaches and just thought like, what if everybody's actually partially right? And they figured out exactly what works for them. But the problem is so many experts figured out what worked for them and then tried to make that a dogma that worked for everybody. And I think the wisdom in it is that we can learn something from any approach and from any expert. But at the end of the day, we have to integrate what works in our own life and to be very cognizant, whether it be through testing or logging or measuring metrics in our own life, what's actually going to work for us. And then if you're a mom, of course, that's compounded by also trying to figure out that equation for each of your kids. That's such a valid point. And, you know, with Jesse and I having this podcast, speaking to different people every week with a different dietary dogma or a different healing story, it can get very confusing for our listeners. It can be very overwhelming. But at the same time, there is something in everything, I think, for everyone. And you're very correct that you got to take those puzzle pieces together and build what works for you. 
people like us who are on this journey and in the know and doing research, I feel like we have some level of confidence that we can start to do that. But it's the newbie who's coming in who can feel so overwhelmed with this information and where to begin and what to start with. So out of all this research that you've done, and you've got this extensive blog, and you've written so many articles, what would you say are some common threads and things that kind of come up over and over again that you have seen work for many people across the board? If you were to pick maybe two or three, whether it's for Hashimoto's or just for healing in general. Yeah, it's such a great question. And I think there are some definite non-negotiables that are across the board that do work for everybody. It's just going to be a degree of that. And so I think like the first things you have to figure out are the core free things like getting enough sleep, reducing your stress level, breathing, like the things that are free, just movement, sunlight, those things don't cost anything and they're so undervalued. But assuming someone's already got those kind of things in the works or they're part of the routine, there definitely seem to be a few commonalities beyond that. And the great thing is that they're also not expensive or difficult to fix. And the two that, I'll say three that have come up over and over both in working with people and also just in writing and research The first being things like vegetable oils or like any kind of artificially created foods. The more I see in research, the more I'm convinced there's no biological need for those. They're easy to eliminate. And if you eliminate foods, for instance, that have vegetable oils or highly refined omega-6 oils, you eliminate a lot of problematic foods. So for people who are overwhelmed, I always say that's a really good starting point just to look there because there are great alternatives. They remove most dangerous foods from your diet. And your body really doesn't know how to handle those kind of fats. So if you replace them with beneficial fats, that alone is a really good switch. Another one that has become a tremendous soapbox for me is plastics. I think that this is something that's going to become increasingly important in both the environmental world and also just the health world in the next decade. In fact, I think it's becoming a global problem that if we don't address, it's going to have really drastic consequences. Our bodies don't know how to handle plastic. We know things like they have estrogen mimicking compounds. They affect our hormones. They affect our cellular function. We also now know, for instance, that plastic has essentially saturated the planet. We have floating islands of plastic the size of Texas in the ocean, and they found plastic compounds under several kilometers of ice in the Antarctic. So the planet is fully saturated and something that we can all work to reduce or completely eliminate. And that's something I write a lot about is how to reduce plastic use in the home, especially if you are pregnant or have children. It's a really, really important issue. And then lastly, processed sugar. I think that there's so much debate right now, rightfully so, and so much controversy about carbohydrates. And I think that conversation is wonderful. We need to be continuing to evaluate how much carbohydrates people need. And there's a personalized aspect to that as well. But I very firmly maintain that nobody has a biological need for processed sugar ever. And so that's something I write a lot about as well. And so I think if those three things alone can just be addressed, that makes a drastic difference in lifestyle and health. I love that. Thank you. So let's get back to your story. So where are you at now with your Hashimoto's? Have you brought your antibodies down? Are you feeling in a really good place? Is it a constant struggle? Give us a picture or a snapshot of where you're at right now. So now I would officially be considered in remission. My antibodies are normal. I don't have any symptoms. Certainly there have been struggles like that pop up, especially stress related. And I have to be very careful when I was pregnant, for instance, just to make sure that my levels were staying low and to keep a closer eye on it. So I worked really closely with a doctor during those periods, but now would be definitely considered in remission. I feel like for me, the part I don't talk about as much was addressing the mental and emotional side because that was the final trigger for me. The being type A, I always just figured I could push through the emotions. I could ignore the emotions. I could power through and I would just keep doing more and I would check all the boxes and I would have this regimen and then I would be fine. And it wasn't until I really tackled that, that I fully felt like I broke through and really was completely in remission. and felt normal again. Several years ago, probably four years ago now, I actually got to a point where I was extremely close to a nervous breakdown. I was having panic attacks. I was incredibly stressed trying to run a business with the blog and also maintain a household and take care of my kids and homeschool and all of the stresses that came with that. And there was even a moment where I had the tab up and I was very, very close to deleting the blog because I realized I couldn't keep doing everything like that. And if something had to give, it couldn't be my family. So the blog was going to have to go away. And there was also, at that point, a lot of learning how to deal with my own emotions and just all of the negativity that can come with the online world and the personal attacks that were really like getting to me at that point. But it was a very much eye-opening moment too, because I realized I could not keep doing that. I could not keep living in that way. And so I was going to have to figure out some way to get through that and to calm the emotional side and to reduce my stress. I took a step back and realized the blog was systematized. It was running. It was wonderful. Like I loved the writing. I loved the community. And it just 
work? How is it that I can run this blog and with this team and everything is going great? And then at home, I just feel like I'm drowning underneath all of the things that the kids need and the house needs and my husband needs and just keeping up health. Why does it feel so much more daunting? And I realized it was because in the blog and in the business side, I was running everything with systems and I had long-term goals and I was working towards objectives and there was no unknown. The variables were solved. Things were just running on a system and I had help. I had a team that was involved. Whereas at home, I was trying to balance everything myself, keep up with everything in my head and do everything for everyone. At that point, I realized I need to start running my life a little bit more like I'm running my business or I'm not going to make it. I'm going to literally have a nervous breakdown. And so I started systematizing my home life, not in like a military regimented way at all, but just in realizing that it wasn't actually doing all of these things that was causing me the stress. It was the knowing that all of these things needed to be done and constantly having to balance that in my head that was causing the stress. So by creating systems and schedules for all of those things, I could take the emotional and mental burden away when it wasn't that time for that particular thing to happen. And then by involving other members of my family, just like I had a team with the blog, I was able to even out the responsibility. And also it was very positive for my kids because they then learned all of these new skills around the house. So it wasn't an overnight process, but within about six months, it was this drastic change that let me then start working through the emotional and mental side and not having as much day-to-day stress so that I could work through like some underlying emotional and trauma issues that I had myself. And now at this point, several years later, I can look back and say, I still have six kids. We now actually have four businesses and I'm never stressed. But the addressing the mental and emotional side was, I think, the key last puzzle piece for me that I resisted for so long because I thought I could just power through it. Now we're going to take a quick break from our chat with Katie to give a shout out to our show partner, Beekeepers Naturals. The honey that comes from Beekeepers Naturals is not just your average honey. This is raw, unpasteurized honey the way honey should be. You may have grown up with honey that was in a squeezable brown bear, but unfortunately, that is dead honey. Real honey is actually alive, full of enzymes and minerals and nutrients, and it's going to boost your immunity and it's also going to help with longevity. Honey is truly a superfood. And we absolutely love the honey that comes from Beekeepers Naturals. We put it in our morning chia bowls. We put it in our smoothies. We put it in elixirs. And sometimes we even have a small taste of it before bed because a little bit of honey is actually said to help you sleep better. So if you haven't tried the Beekeepers Natural Honey yet, add it to your cart. Maybe add in some bee pollen and some bee elixir, some brain nootropics, and so many of their other beautiful superfoods. And as a listener of our show, you get 15% off all your Beekeepers Naturals products. To take advantage, go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash beekeepers. Again, that URL is ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash beekeepers. Also, if you spend $60 or more, you get free shipping. Go and load up on all these amazing bee products today. You are going to love them. And now a shout out from other show partner, Thrive Market. If you're a mama and raising a family, whether it's big or small, sometimes it can really be a hassle to get out to the grocery store every week. And in that case, Thrive Market makes it really easy to have a one-stop shop for all of your health food products. You can get everything from base ingredients to make your family meals like olive oil, coconut oil, apple cider vinegar, herbs and spices, and even your healthy snacks. So go ahead and stock up at Thrive Market, get all your goodies, and feed your family well. And the best part is that you're getting all of these products at 20 to 50% off of regular retail value In addition, as a listener of our show, you're getting 25% off your whole order, plus a 30-day free trial and free shipping. To take advantage of this incredible offer, all you need to do is go to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash Thrive Market. Again, that URL is ultimahealthpodcast.com slash Thrive Market. Go and put your first order in today and take advantage of this incredible deal. And now back to our chat with Katie. And that's so huge because I think that's what so many people and specifically moms struggle with is balancing that, let alone having a successful business, a team to manage and six kids, Katie, let's not gloss over that. You have six kids, which is not common these days. So let's just expand on that. I want to get into the systems in a little bit and talk about what you've created and give some tips for moms out there and for families. But was it always a desire of yours to have six kids or a big family? Did you come from a big family? Take us through that. And also, most importantly, is you had Hashimoto's and had many pregnancies. Were all of your kids born while you had Hashimoto's? So I definitely don't come from a big family. I only have one brother. 
but my husband does. He's one of six. And when I married him, I just realized how close his siblings were. And that was something I wanted for my kids and close to my brother as well, but it wasn't always that way. And when we were growing up, if we were at odds, we didn't have anybody to play with. I knew I wanted there to be at least a few so that they'd always have a playmate. I don't think big families are right for everybody, but it was definitely what was right for us at that point. So yeah, all of my kids were born Well, I have Hashimoto's and I guess technically like once you have it, you always sort of have it, even though I'm in remission. The last one, I was much, much better and would probably have been considered in remission the entire pregnancy. She's almost three now. So that was something I did have to learn to navigate was being pregnant and having Hashimoto side by side and making sure I was keeping my antibodies low, my inflammation low during pregnancy so that hopefully none of the risk factors would be passed on to my kids. And thankfully, I think all the dietary and lifestyle interventions and being very, very cognizant of my stress load and my sleep during pregnancy, that was really instrumental. And it seems to have worked because all of our kids have not seemed to have any effects from me having Hashimoto's while I was pregnant with them. And even in, we finally did all their genetic testing with nutrition genome. And when I did the consult about it, he's like, so you have a bunch of genetic problems and your husband has a bunch of genetic problems. This is not mathematically possible, but you guys did not pass any of them on to your kids. So I don't know what to credit that with, but I'm super grateful that that's the case. Wow, that is incredible. And take us through, was there any special things you did as somebody who was pregnant with Hashimoto's that you can maybe help other moms out there who are about to get pregnant or who are pregnant with Hashimoto's? And I also just want to clarify that, yes, you have Hashimoto's for life, but I, I guess I was more asking specifically before if your symptoms were very active during all of your pregnancy. So thank you for clarifying that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think in hindsight, too, it was a blessing in disguise that I was still having to figure out and manage a lot of that myself. It wasn't until the last couple of pregnancies when I actually had a practitioner and a doctor who knew what they were doing in my corner. And so because I was trying to manage it with strictly diet and lifestyle, I was even more cognizant of all of those symptoms. And I was very, very attentive to what I was putting in my body and even just things I was coming in contact with to keep those symptoms at bay because I knew how much was on the line. And so I think that was actually a good thing because I was so attuned to that because I didn't have any other option. I wasn't able to be medicated. The only thing I could do at that point until I found a doctor, I was able to lab test myself, but without a doctor, I wasn't able to get medication. So I was having to manage myself. And so I was just very, very cognizant of diet and lifestyle. So What I had to do to keep things in check at that point, there was a lot of lifestyle factors and some were easy. Like I realized for myself, if I was getting time outside every day, especially in the sunshine and especially in the morning, that my thyroid levels did a lot better, which makes sense when you look at cortisol patterns and melatonin and what we now know about circadian rhythm. But at the time, I just knew that I had different lab results if I made that a priority. So I was making sure I was spending time outside and I was looking at food and diet in a different way than most people. So I think a lot of pregnant women fall into the trap of just not wanting to gain weight or completely giving into cravings. And that's how they kind of navigate what they're going to eat during pregnancy. And I knew that I likely had some underlying issues, probably including leaky gut and things that were not functioning optimally because of the Hashimoto's. And so I was eating extremely nutrient dense and I was focusing on the nutrition side and the nutrient density of foods pretty much exclusively versus wasn't looking at calories or trying not to gain weight and definitely wasn't trying to give into any craving. I was very, very careful about what I was eating. And so my fifth one actually was born with something that was called a battle door placenta, which is a odd placenta presentation where the cord comes out the side. And the midwife even said that if I hadn't been eating such a nutrient dense diet, she probably would have had failure to thrive or been extremely low birth weight because it's very common with that kind of presentation of the placenta. So In hindsight, I think it was really good that I had to learn during those years, as frustrating as it was, I had to really learn how to listen to my own body and to tune into nourishing the body and avoiding anything that was going to take away from that versus I think so many people with thyroid problems get stuck in that cycle of just like, oh, I don't want to gain weight. So they're calorie restricting, which is a further stress on the body and putting the body in sympathetic nervous system versus parasympathetic versus just focusing on nourishing the body and keeping the stress levels low so that you're not feeding stress hormones to the baby either. So earlier you talked about creating systems at home to help facilitate more balance and just more flow with everything. And I know part of that is getting your kids to actually do things around the home that they're capable of, things like doing the laundry, helping with dishes. I just would like you to get into some of the specifics of how you've created these systems at home. What do they look like? How do they facilitate a smoother life at home? Absolutely. I think the first core principle of it is realizing, I think a lot of moms 
completely well-intentioned tend to do everything around the home because yes, if we're being honest, we can actually do it better, but also because it's easier, at least in the beginning. And so moms kind of fall in this habit of doing all of it themselves or asking for help when they need quote unquote help versus actually having team members involved. That was a mental shift for me was realizing that this is not my household. This is our household and I'm not the only one to be tasked with managing it, nor am I going to be the only one to actually do anything in the household. And so we made a shift in our parenting, my husband and I, that we don't do anything for the kids that they're capable of doing themselves. And we pulled from our own childhood experience a little bit in this, in that his parents, there were six of them. So they actually did have to do a lot around the house pretty young. We don't feel like it was communicated super well and they didn't feel like they were on a team. It felt more like they were required to do it kind of by a dictator at that point. But for me, my parents were very academically focused. So we were required to work really hard in school and to perform and get good grades. But to balance that out, I feel like my parents did a lot of stuff around the house and kind of managed that part of our life for us so that we could focus on school, which meant that in college, I had to learn pretty much I didn't know how to cook, didn't know how to clean, had to learn how to do my laundry. I didn't learn to cook till I got married. So we wanted our kids to have those requisite skills before they left home, realizing those are actually very much functional parts of life. So we stopped doing anything for them that they could do themselves and realized they also are capable much earlier of doing a lot of things that we don't give them credit for. So in our house right now, that means that all of the kids from the five-year-old up do their own laundry. They help prepare meals. They can all hand wash dishes. They can load the dishwasher. They can clean the house. They're learning things like managing finances. They do that on their own, but they also understand and are involved with the household finances and grocery shopping, budgeting just any way that we could pull them in and let them feel like they're not just helping, but actually a valuable part of the team. And we realized when they felt like they had ownership of a realm of the house or a realm of life, they were much more invested in it and likely to do it without being reminded or nagged or any of that. And we also make sure that we really consciously create a culture in our family that does feel like a team where they do know that we're all in this together and they are a valuable part of the system. They're not just many slaves that we have help us around the house at all. They're very much an active part of the house. And that's just something we have like built into our core family culture at this point. That's so amazing. And Katie, we definitely have to get into how you've raised your kids in terms of nutrition. So I know you've written extensively on first foods. You've got a section in your book on this in terms of what to feed your kids first versus what's commonly told to parents. So let's talk about first foods and raising kids on a healthy, wholesome diet. Absolutely. And there's so much cool research on this right now. I feel like we are seeing such a rise, for instance, in childhood allergies that there's a lot of research being dedicated towards this. And I've now updated some of that content. Because of the Hashimoto's, it kind of was a lens through which I looked at first foods for my kids as well. I didn't want to give them inflammatory foods as first foods. And I wanted to make sure they were getting nutrient dense foods. And so we always started off with that in mind, realizing also that babies are born with a partially leaky gut and that's on purpose so that antibodies and different compounds in their mom's milk can get through into their body to help develop natural immunity. But knowing that, you want to make sure you navigate that carefully. So maybe the first thing that you throw at them should not be Cheerios, which is this mixture of all kinds of different things their bodies are not used to handling, but rather things that help the gut to seal and to heal and then to be able to digest correctly. So we start with very gentle things like bone broth, avocado, cooked vegetables, proteins. And then also I make sure to give probiotics at a young age to keep the gut good. Hopefully like our kids are going into life with good gut bacteria to begin with, but there's a lot of factors that can deplete that, whether it be antibiotic use early in life or even the birth process. If antibiotics were given during the birth process or one of our kids was born via C-section and babies born via C-section have a different bacterial profile than babies born vaginally. So knowing that, making sure that you're cognizant of nourishing the gut, giving probiotics, and keeping inflammation low, especially when you're introducing new foods. And there's some really cool research in companies like the top one I found is called Ready, Set, Food that are also helping navigate that early introduction of allergens because the research is now showing you do want to introduce those things, but you need to do it carefully. So you don't want to completely avoid gluten and dairy and anything that could be inflammatory for too long because there's an immune window. But you need to make sure you introduce those things in a safe way And so what they're finding is that the best outcome for kids is to be able to introduce those things in a clean, organic form one at a time and in very, very tiny doses at first and then increasing the dose slightly. So this doesn't mean that you need to like feed your kids gluten every day, but you can introduce it in a way that lets their immune system acclimate so that they aren't as likely to have an immune reaction and a long-term allergy from it. And so that's something else that I've recently really been in the research on for first foods 
in a general sense for our kids, our goal is always to focus on nutrient density and making sure that what we have at home is very nutrient dense, clean, nourishing, and is a wide variety of foods. Because when you look at the statistics, most people are eating the same 15 or less foods over and over. Whereas as human species, we used to eat, I believe it was like over 200 plants in any given period of time. So trying to include diversity and nutrient density in the diet. And the way we kind of look at the division of labor in our house, I look at it that I am, as the mom and the person buying groceries, responsible for providing them with nourishment and food and cooking the food, although they help. And as kids, their responsibility is to listen to their body and learn to eat when they're hungry. So that's something I think we do different maybe than a lot of families is they're not required to eat everything on their plate. They actually serve themselves. They typically don't end up with extra food anyway, but we never force them to eat food, especially if they don't like it or want it. But I also don't cook special meals. So I prepare the meals. They can choose to eat it or not eat it. And we're totally fine with that. I think fasting has its place and when kids choose to fast and they choose to miss a meal, they're not going to starve in one meal. And we kind of like look at it, the division of labor that way. And I get asked pretty often too, like, how do you navigate that when you're not home? And we do eat most meals at home. So it's not a very common issue for us, but I also am not at all a food dictator, which is um, surprising to some people, but I don't tell my kids what they can and can't eat. I educate them and I tell them about the compounds in food that can benefit the body or things that can cause inflammation. And we talk about that. I want them to have a full understanding of that. But other than allergies or like we are young babies until they have developed proper immunity, I don't dictate what they can eat. And I don't tell them they can't eat something if they're not home. So I will never cook sugar in this house. We don't have processed food ever, but I'm not going to hover and tell them they can't eat those things when they're somewhere else. They're educated. They know what's in it. And if they choose to eat those things, then that's their choice somewhere else. Because I also don't want to create a dynamic where it feels like the forbidden thing or like alcohol does for many kids where they want to try it or indulge in it in excess when they're older because it was forbidden when they were younger. So we try to find that balance in education and autonomy. That makes a lot of sense. And Katie, I want to come back to first foods and talk about how do you determine when it's time to start introducing solid foods to kids and tied into that, how do you know when it's time to start weaning off of breastfeeding? Mm, This is definitely going to be one, no matter how anybody answers, it's a little bit controversial. So I'll try to stick to several factors. So there's the traditional wives tale tends to be when they get their first tooth, they're ready for food. But I have had babies that got their first tooth at like two and a half months old, and I didn't think their immune systems were ready for food. The research right now, the best of science, it seems to be showing that early introduction between four to six months or certainly four to eight months of age is the sweet spot for immunity, but then also balancing that with the gut maturity and their probiotic balance. So I gave probiotics very young. I would just kind of rub it on the inside of their mouth to try to start to give them a leg up in the immunity department and the gut health department. And then for me, the general rule was about six months was when I introduced food. And a couple of them, it was like a couple weeks before six months, depending on if they did have a lot of teeth or if they were showing signs of readiness. And if their immune system was strong, they didn't have any eczema issues or anything that would signal that they weren't ready. And then introducing one food at a time, you know, in a very careful way that you can follow and make sure they're not having a reaction weaning, that's a tougher one. I think that's very individualized. I think mother's intuition definitely comes into play here. And I definitely don't ever judge a mom for any decision she makes in this department. I think every case is so different. For me, it's always been baby led. So when they stopped showing interest and they would eventually just stop nursing on their own, usually before two years was when mine did. But my kids have always been very, very independent and active. So that was much more, they were just done and they wanted to go play. I know some moms, it definitely works to nurse much longer. So I think that's a very, very individualized thing. But I do think if possible, the research definitely shows if a mom can breastfeed exclusively until six months, there's some tremendous benefits there. And if she can breastfeed partially through a year, there's also benefits to that as well. But of course, you know, mom's mental health is a big factor there as well. So I don't ever want to tell a mom that she didn't do it right because she didn't follow those exact guidelines. That's just what the general science tends to point to right now. Now we're going to take another quick break from our chat with Katie to give a shout out to our show partner, Four Sigmatic. So I've told you guys before that I'm not a coffee drinker and I'm really not, but we recently got our hands on the Adaptogen Coffee Mix from Four Sigmatic and on the box it says it tastes like cinnamon. So I really was intrigued. I had to give it a go and I figured I'd add in this coffee mix into an already made elixir that I was making with 
coconut butter, coconut milk, a little bit of collagen. So I threw in this packet and it took this elixir to the next level. And I have to tell you, it was absolutely delicious. The taste and of course, how I felt. And someone who doesn't consume coffee that often, it really had an incredible effect on me. And the beautiful thing is that this is loaded with adaptogens like ashwagandha, Siberian ginseng, Tulsi, and I just feel so balanced, so stable, and so focused. So I'm super excited for people who are out there who are like me, not regular coffee drinkers. Try the adaptogen coffee mix, bring it into the routine, and you're going to feel how wonderful it is. And as a listener of our show, you get 15% off all your Four Sigmatic purchases. To take advantage, go to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash Four Sigmatic. Again, that URL is ultimahealthpodcast.com slash Four Sigmatic. And if you bundle your order together, spend $100 or more, you get free shipping. Since I love having my coffee in the morning, it's fun to have Marnie joining me on this adventure now. Happy sipping. And now a shout out to our other show partner, Organifi. I don't think we've had a chance to tell you yet that Organifi makes a delicious, complete plant-based protein. It's non-GMO, loaded with 20 grams per serving, and it can be used as a meal replacement, but it's also enhanced with multivitamins, MCTs, and digestive enzymes, making it super nourishing. And when it's blended into a smoothie, it's super creamy, it's balanced, and it tastes like a milkshake. I am very picky about my protein powders, and Organifi totally makes the cut. So if you haven't tried it yet, you got to try it in chocolate or vanilla or grab a tub of each and keep them on hand for that protein fix. And as a listener of our show, you get 20% off all your Organifi purchases. To take advantage, go to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash Organifi. Again, that URL is ultimahealthpodcast.com slash Organifi and Organifi ends in an eye. The smoothies Marnie is making with the Organifi protein are delicious. Can't wait for you to try it. And now back to our chat with Katie. I want to move into homeschooling because this is something that you do as well, which is amazing. And I commend you for that. So tell us about how you've created this environment at home for all your kids and, and how it works. What does this look like? Yeah, this was a decision we also made early on. And I so many parents say, like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you do that. And it's so much work. And I just feel like I should preface by saying it's actually easier for us. I don't feel like it's at all heroic or, you know, anything amazing that we do. It's just what worked for our family. But for us, one of our core values as a family is travel. And so homeschooling was a natural fit for us because it allowed a lot more autonomy to travel and we could take school with us. And the reason for that for us is just realizing. Both my husband and I have kind of gotten to where we are in life because of challenges that we had earlier in life and realizing that like those struggles make you better as an adult or certainly make you an entrepreneur in many cases, but you also as a parent can't purposely make your kid's life tough just so that they turn out to be a good adult. So travel is a wonderful solution to that because you get this amazing rich experience that also comes with its own share of challenges that you all can adapt to together. So we knew we would want to travel a lot with our kids and that also we would want to have a very rich learning environment that would nourish creativity and critical thinking and make sure they continue to think outside the box. And so we've always homeschooled since our first one started school and kind of our method has evolved over time and actually is like somewhat technological at this point so that they can take their iPads and computers with them when we travel. But we also knew that we wanted to keep a focus on creativity and critical thinking and also entrepreneurship, which is another core value in our family. So our schoolroom doesn't at all look like a classroom. It's very active. So we have like mini trampolines and inversion tables and balance boards and just anything that can keep them active while they're learning, especially with our boys, but actually with our girls too. There's a very kinesthetic component. They seem to learn much better when they're in movements in some way. And then we also take frequent breaks for activity. So they're definitely not ever just sitting at a desk. And then we make sure to structure the education in a way that's very kind of like a Montessori Waldorf mix when they're young. And then more Socratic method as they get older, very question-based, critical thinking based. They're actively involved in the process. They're not just doing worksheets. And now with our oldest being 12, we're just starting to transition into the next phase of homeschooling, which for us is very focused on entrepreneurship. So he's finishing up what would be pretty much his high school curriculum. He'll finish it about 13. And our goal with that was that we wanted them to be done with the book work and the requisite skills they could take the PSAT or the SAT and be fine at that point. And then those years until they were 18, we would focus on entrepreneurship in kind of an incubator type scenario. So we have a contract with our kids that we were not going to sign off on their driver's license or give them a phone until they have started a business that's profitable for one year. So they know this, those wheels are turning. And once they hit 13, we actually like very actively step in and help them do that. So 
since he'll be finished with the schoolwork, we'll be helping him to think through business ideas, create business plans, test them for profitability, and then run them consistently until they're profitable. And so he's already got a couple in the works, but we figured that was the best way to teach them so many real life skills like managing finances, balancing risk. When should you take a risk? When should you not? Just thinking through business plans in general, consistency, so many values that are tied up in entrepreneurship. And so that's kind of our next phase of homeschooling that we're just now jumping into. So amazing. You've really thought this out and it just sounds so well-rounded. And since you have six kids, it works well. You've got a little community there. But what about for families that have one or two kids? Do you recommend them teaming up with other families? So there's, you know, maybe four or more kids. Is there any thoughts on this or it doesn't really matter as long as the kids are getting well-rounded, diverse education? I would say I definitely recommend teaming up with other families, but I would say it doesn't necessarily have to be for school. We actually try to be as efficient as possible with school so that they're getting the bookwork side out of the way very quickly and leaving lots of time for independent play and purposeful boredom. I feel like that's when kids are their most creative. And so I'd say for families that there are just one or two kids, that's the perfect way to just focus on school for a couple of hours, which only a couple of kids, you can be so efficient and get the book work done and then make sure the kids have opportunities with other kids, both for the social aspect, but also just for that creative free play outside. So for our kids, they finish school typically in the morning by noon really easily. And then they spend the afternoon pretty much until dark outside. The way I feel like kids should be climbing trees, riding bikes, building forts. We underestimate so much how important those things are for kids and for their mental health. And I've interviewed so many experts and psychiatrists and occupational therapists who said like so many kids are suffering because they're not given those types of experiences that help not just physically form their vestibular system and their limbic system and their ability to assess risk, but there's actually like a very important psychological component of things like climbing a tree and falling out or learning where your boundaries are. And when kids don't have those formative experiences, they have trouble taking risks later in life, or they have trouble with impulse control later in life, or there's just long lasting effects that we don't really realize because we're keeping kids safe, quote unquote, inside, and they're inside playing or on video games or on technology, and they're missing out on those really formative experiences that happen when they're bored or when they're being creative outside, and then they get the independence there as well. So I want to move into talking about the home and chemicals inside the home. This is a big area of your book. You've got tons of recipes on your blog as well. So for someone who's new to this, who hasn't really addressed some of the toxins in their home, and hopefully a lot of our listeners are, are more advanced than that, but you never know. So I want to kind of go through what are the things that we want to look out for? What are the most common chemicals and environmental toxins that are available to us in our home that we want to remove? And then I want to get into some DIY things that we can take care of from scratch at home. So the great news here is that there's very much the 80-20 principle that comes into play. Like There's a small number of really harmful things in the house. And if we remove those, we get rid of 80% of our exposure. And also, we've kind of been fed this line by big advertising for so long that we actually need this gigantic suite of products, both in personal care and in cleaning. And the truth is, in both of those cases, there's a very small number of products that do a lot of work across the board that can replace a whole lot of products. So you're not just saving money, but you're avoiding chemical exposure and you're simplifying your life. I know that minimalism is an increasingly popular thing right now because there's so much of everything in modern life that I think people are finding freedom in reducing that across the board. And so for people who are just starting out, and I know that your listeners are definitely advanced, so I'll try to keep it succinct and also throw in some tips for people who are more advanced. But the laundry room is definitely the starting place for some of the worst offenders, not just because of laundry products themselves, but also because that tends to be where people store a lot of other chemicals, pesticides, and drain cleaners. All of those things tend to be in laundry rooms as well. But even if you're just focusing on the laundry side, this is a tremendous source of exposure, especially when you're talking about kids or anybody who has any kind of sensitivity. So that smell that you smell when you smell fresh laundry or you walk by someone's house when they have their dryer running, or maybe you have that friend and you know what like brand of laundry detergent they use because you can always smell it on their clothes. There's specific types of chemicals that are engineered to be able to last for a long time and cling to clothes. And that's what they're putting in laundry detergents. They can have that fresh smell for a long time. Unfortunately, those can also be really harmful to the body. We're now learning that they are potential carcinogens. They are potential neurotoxins, especially in children. And truly their only purpose is just to create that fresh laundry smell. They're not actually getting clothes any cleaner by being there. So that's a really easy switch to make. There's certainly some great pre-made natural laundry detergents you can buy if you just wanted to buy a more natural one. You don't have to 
DIY anything if you don't want to. Just choose one. The Environmental Working Group has a great database. So you can actually rate or go through and see what your laundry detergent rates as and pick one that is much lower on the scale of toxicity. And that alone is a much bigger factor than most people realize because not only are your clothes touching your skin all day, for most of us, 24 hours a day between our clothes, our bed sheets, we are in constant contact with that. But we're also breathing those VOCs and those compounds in laundry detergent all day. And so this is a chronic low level exposure that can keep the body in sympathetic nervous system versus parasympathetic. And just literally your body thinks it's always kind of at war and it's a super easy switch to make. Same with dryer sheets. They're engineered to keep that smell in clothes for longer and they're an easy thing to switch out. So either to a more natural version or things like wool dryer balls are very sustainable because you buy them once and they last forever and ever. And you can just use those in place of dryer sheets. So little switches like that truly don't take any really extra time or money or effort once you make them and they can make a big impact long-term. Same things with just household cleaners. So many of us buy separate cleaners for glass, for all-purpose cleaners, for toilets, for bathrooms. We have like 20 cleaners to clean our house when something that gets something clean will clean any of those surfaces. And there's now some great cleaning concentrates, which also reduce that plastic exposure that are much more environmentally friendly and safer for kids. So the one I personally use is called Branch Basics. It's a concentrate. You can mix any of those cleaners. You can actually use it for laundry. Um, It's so safe. I use it to remove my eye makeup. You can use glass spray bottles, reusable, and then you only have this one bottle that's recyclable as waste every six months versus 20 different cleaners that actually have all these harmful compounds in them that you're using all the time. So little switches like that in the cleaning routine can make a big, big difference. Same thing with personal care. For women especially, we're constantly told that we need 90 different products and serums and all of these crazy things for beauty. And just like with cleaning, there's a few products that can pay off across the board, whether it be you know natural oils that can be used for your hair, for your skin, et cetera, or just natural cleaners that can do double duty as body wash, face wash, et cetera. I think there is a more personalized component there, but whether it's making your own or buying your own, finding the ones that work with your complexion and your skin type, those little changes can have a really, really drastic impact over time. So let's get into things that we can make ourselves at home and some common ingredients we want to have on hand for replacing some of these cleaners. You know, I know there are some brands that you said we can go to and look for, but if we do want to make things from scratch, give us a list of of things that we can buy so that we can make our own solutions. Probably are things that your listeners already have in their house right now. So if you have the basics of things like vinegar and baking soda and a little bit more advanced washing soda and borax, you can make a tremendous amount of cleaners without even needing to go to the store. And I have recipes for all of those in the book. And there's also recipes for a lot of them. Just on my blog, you can just Google wellness mama cleaners and they should all come up. But truly you're talking pennies to make versus several dollars to buy. And they are just as effective. So I have one cabinet that has all of the ingredients for that. And I just have, like I said, vinegar, baking soda, washing soda, borax, Dr. Bronner's and sal suds, and just a few essential oils. And that becomes all of the cleaners I need pretty much for my entire house. And I'm glad you mentioned that they're so much cheaper because I think a lot of times the barrier or perceived barrier for people getting into health and wellness is the cost. And there's certain areas that it is harder to manipulate the cost when it comes to, you know, buying quality meats. And for vegetables, you can go to farmer's markets and do things like that to save on cost. But it's just great that there's a solution there that can help cut the overall cost down for people. Absolutely. You're so right that the dietary part, unfortunately, does, or at least right now, while so many processed foods are still subsidized, organic is very much often more expensive. And this is definitely an area where it's very much cheaper and I would say easier as well. And to expand on that, things that people can do at home to cut the cost on food is growing a garden or having herbs or, you know, depending on how people live, they can have small little pots in their home or they can have garden beds outside. So let's talk about what it takes to maybe put together some simple garden beds or how people can start growing at home? This is something I really encourage, like you said, regardless of where they live or what their home situation is like, you can always do something. And there's far-reaching benefits beyond just the food. So certainly like the food that we grow ourselves and pick and eat in the same day is much more nutrient dense. And we know it doesn't have chemicals or anything we don't want on it. But even more than that, there's so, so much research showing the benefits of, for instance, just spending time outside for the fresh air and the sunlight, but also for interaction with the dirt. So as we learn more about the microbiome and gut health, there's all of this data pointing to the fact that our over-sanitized lives are actually having a really drastic effect on our gut and skin health. 
So we know that statistically, people who garden regularly or spend that time outside regularly tend to live longer. And there's a lot of components that come into play there. So for instance, you're having contact with the earth. There's an idea called grounding, which is a little bit controversial, but the idea basically being that when we have regular contact with the earth, it helps our body electrically to find balance. And we now know more and more that the body is a very electrical being. And so that is a tremendous factor in health. Also, we know how important vitamin D is, for instance, in reducing the risk of many types of cancers and other diseases. And so spending time outside, if you do it correctly, you're getting moderate sun exposure, not ever burning, but that vitamin D is super important. Along with fresh air, we know that indoor air is often much more polluted than outdoor air, and that even just a couple hours a day outside can have a tremendous impact on health. And the Japanese call this, um, they actually make it a practice and call it forest bathing, but spending purposeful time outside to get fresh air. And then the interaction with the soil and the trillions of bacteria that are present in the soil. I have a whole post actually about how important dirt is and how we've lost this as a society. And so my kids were babies. I would actually have a pile of dirt that they could play in that was organic dirt just for the microbial interaction. And we know that that signals, for instance, in babies, things like creation of zinc and iron in the body in the way that it's supposed to happen. So, so many factors from gardening that are beneficial beyond just the fact that we get food from it. So it's something I really encourage people to do no matter what their situation. And I look back to times like during World War II, they would call it victory gardens. And they encouraged everybody to grow something to contribute to the effort and to be in that together and to supply food. And I think that's something we could really benefit from bringing back. Thankfully, we're not in that type of situation with a world war, but just realizing that our food supply is very contaminated. There's a lot of people on this planet and we can all make a difference even in a small way by just growing a portion of our own food and then get all of these ancillary benefits as well. You touched on the benefit of gardening, of being outside, and earlier you touched on video games and electronics and kids. So I'm just curious, I want to bring this together and talk about with this world we're in these days where there's different smartphones and tablets and video games, everything's just so advanced. How have you been able to balance that with all your kids so they're not being constantly drawn to that and they're finding time to get outside and and play with other kids? This is such a good question. And I think it's truly a question that is going to be pivotal for our time and especially for our kids' time, because as we all know, technology is not going away. And all those of us who are entrepreneurs and in this health world, we largely make a living because of it. So we're grateful for it. But at the same time, we know from the data right now that looking at screens too much changes your brain and the feedback loop of social media, especially at a young age, changes your brain. And that overuse of certain types of technology before the brain reaches certain milestones, can have a really lasting impact. And so just like how we are with food, I didn't want technology to ever become a forbidden thing that the kids gravitated towards because it was forbidden. But I also knew that too much exposure too young was going to be really detrimental to them. So we took the approach of educating. That's always our core thing is explaining to them, being very upfront with them and realizing they're capable of understanding so much when you talk to them, like they're responsible and give them the respect of explaining it to them. So for us, that's been our core first approach. And largely, it's never become too much of an issue for us. So our kids, we have a TV in our house, but it's very rarely on. They have iPads for school, but that's pretty much all they use it for. And then we have a phone that is the family phone that stays in the house. They use it the oldest one's babysitting, but they don't have their own technology that stays in their room. And we have made that kind of a core principle by modeling it. So all of our phones get charged in one place, phones and iPads, and They stay there, especially at night, and they're in airplane mode. So nobody has, including the adults, has phones in our bed that we're on all the time. And we try to make a point not to be on our own phones all the time so they don't see us on our phones all the time and think that that's a normal part of life, just like we try not to watch too much TV. And I think that saying, it's so cliche but so true, is that kids follow what we do, not what we say. And so realizing that, my husband and I try to make an effort to be outside and play outside and have fun and do active things, and the kids naturally gravitate towards that as well. But also, we've really made a dedicated effort in the last couple of years to foster community and to find places where the kids naturally had an environment where there were other kids playing outside and they wanted to gravitate towards that. And I think that's been a really big factor as well. And something that's also largely missing in modern society that's a very big soapbox for me as well is just in this overly connected technological world, we've lost actual community. And if you look at the data, We know that strong relationships and strong community is one of the strongest predictors of health, and it's inversely associated with mortality. So basically, the stronger your relationships and community, the less your risk of dying from all-cause mortality. And it makes sense when you look at things like blue zones, but we keep trying to pull out like, oh, maybe it's that they drink wine, or maybe it's that they have seafood, or they eat enough vegetables. 
And it, my theory is it could very much also just be that all of these places, they have very strong community and they have a very strong reason to live and they have people they care about and they care about them. And so I think that's the antidote to the technological world is fostering that real sense of community amongst our children and also ourselves and finding those relationships or creating them, making them a priority so that we have that built-in support network and structure and something that makes us want to go outside or spend time with others and not just be inside watching TV. And Katie, coming full circle with my previous question, how as somebody who's running an online business, you have your blog, your podcast, I'm sure you're spending a lot of time on your laptop, you just wrote a book. How do you personally maintain that balance and not get pulled back to the emails again and, and checking out Instagram? And just how do you keep the balance within your own life? This definitely for me goes back to that earlier point about creating systems and for my own mental health. And that was something that I implemented at that point. So on a practical level, I batch everything. So there's a couple days a month when while the kids are working on school, I will just write and I can get through eight or 12 blog posts at a time. And that's kind of my part that I write for the month. Same with podcasting. So on a podcasting day, I'll batch a bunch of podcasts and then I can focus on other things for the rest of the month. But really the thing that made the most difference for me was when I scheduled my whole life and got rid of the emotional stress because everything had a time and a place, I put the most important things on the schedule first. And those were not things like work. The most important things that went on the schedule as non-negotiables were family dinner and homeschooling and time with the kids and our daily gratitude practice and all of that. Those things went on there first because I think as humans, we fill whatever time schedule we're given. And so I knew if I gave myself eight hours a day to work, I would very much find things to do for those eight hours, including probably spend too much time on social media. So instead, I put the things that were actually like long-term life important to me first, and then I made work fit around that. So I only work a couple hours a day. I'm incredibly efficient when I'm working because there's no distractions. It's that singleness of purpose, and I'm not on social media if I'm supposed to be writing, and I'm not trying to like do laundry and write a blog post at the same time. I'm entirely focused on one thing at a time. I make work fit into the time that I give it versus just give myself a lot of time for work. And that subtle shift has made a huge difference. And I would say I'm actually more efficient now in much less time just because my priorities and my mental stress are all figured out. I love that, Katie. And creating a system around that, I think that's going to be really helpful for a lot of people. We've covered so many great tips and strategies for people to implement and certainly for moms and people who are into health in general. But before we let you go, we have to ask you one last question. And that is, what does ultimate health mean to you? To me, ultimate health is finding that balance point in any given day because life is so constantly changing. I don't think you could ever figure out the solution and set and forget for the rest of your life, but it's finding your own way, your own system in life to find that balance point so that in any given amount of time, you're accomplishing those things that you need to accomplish while maintaining your own sanity and balance within your family unit or your relationships and not letting any one aspect of life or health take over more than it should. Love it. And Katie, the new book is The Wellness Mama Five-Step Lifestyle Detox. And other than the listeners getting a copy of that, how can they connect with you after the show? I would love to hear from you guys. Come join my podcast, the Wellness Mama podcast, or there's about 1,200 posts on wellnessmama.com that touch on a lot of the things we talked about today, and you guys can jump in there. All right, excellent. We're going to link everything up over at ultimatehealthpodcast.com for the listeners. And Katie, this has just been a great conversation. It's going to help a lot of people, and we thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. You guys are doing amazing work, and it was an honor to be here. Thank you, Katie. We so appreciate it. We hope you loved today's conversation as much as we did. Katie's just got so many takeaways that you can implement right away into your routine. And make sure that you're following at Wellness Mama on Instagram and at Ultima Health Podcast. Let us know what you think of today's episode. Share it in your stories or on Instagram. We always share tagged photos from our stories on Fridays. So if you tag us and Wellness Mama, we are going to reshare it. So let us know what you think of today's show. For full show notes, be sure and head over to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash 283. We're going to have links there to everything we discussed in a nice show summary. So be sure and check those out. And before we let you go, I want to give some love to our editor and engineer, Jay Sanderson over at podcasttech.com. Jace, you do such a great job putting the show together. Thank you. And this week's fun fact about Jace is that he thinks dark chocolate is the best thing going. Marnie and I agree. We love our dark chocolate, often a dessert of ours after dinner. Have an awesome week. We'll talk soon. Take care.